What a session for crude oil today. Crude enduring oil, epic spasms in prices that had both oil bulls and bears snapping their necks here and there. First, oil was down nearly 2% after the American Petroleum Institute reported last night that we would see a spike in U.S. crude supply. But then when the actual number came out from the EIA, it was a surprise drawdown in crude. Oil then began to climb back up. You see that spike at 10.30 a.m. on the left part of your screen. That's when the number came out. Again, that was a surprise build. And we've seen a couple of weeks now of surprises. And then what do you see now? You see in the aftermarket session, oil is back down nearly 2%, down 1% and 2 third percent as we begin to realize that OPEC still does not have its act together when it comes to cutting output. There are new reports that Russia is against OPEC oil production cuts. They're not a member of OPEC, but they can ignore what OPEC decides to do. Uh, they had agreed with Saudi Arabia that something needed to be done to stabilize prices. Could Vladimir Putin be the one who will kill any deal? And what would this mean for the oil market and oil investors and people who buy oil at the pumps? Gasoline. Joining us now, the American Petroleum Institute CEO and President Jack Gerard. Jack, great to have you. Let yes. me first get to Thank these you. numbers. Last night, the API said that we would see a build of about four and a half million barrels. Then this morning, we saw a drawdown of 553,000 barrels. Uh, how is the calculation so far off here? Well, it's interesting, Liz, because typically our numbers are much closer with, when you look at EIA data and you look at API data. In fact, we use many of the same resources to come to those numbers. So we'll have to look. At, back on it, if you will, and compare the two numbers and see where the differentials are, because we're using primarily the same data to come to those. So right, I know, clearly in this instance, bets. there was a difference. People make bets on your numbers because you guys do have some respectability here, but that's a broad swath of a difference, a rather large gap. What are you changing about how you will gather your data and put it out to the markets the night before every Wednesday when we get the inventory report? Well, we continue the way we always have for many years that uh, many look at in terms of the way we report those numbers, the same processes whereby we collect the information and report it. And like I say, when you look at it historically, API is consistently close to those numbers where they should be. So we'll have to take a close look at what's happened in this last reporting cycle to see what really brought those differences because this is one of the rare times where there is a differential in what's reported to the market. Okay, and this is, this is U.S. output anyway. So let's broaden the aperture it and is. begin to discuss what is going on globally. Vladimir Putin, one minute, as in two days ago, tells the Saudis, we got to do something to stabilize prices. And then his own people, because you know that these oligarchs who run companies like Gazprom, et cetera, they come out and they say, we'll do whatever we want. We don't have to, to be hitched to what OPEC does. Is Russia the key to the success or the death of an OPEC deal? Well, if you look across the board, Liz, there's lots of different players in this, as you've just described. What happens in the Middle East, what happens in Russia. The one that we stay focused on as the American Petroleum Institute is the role that the U.S. plays. And it has been the game changer that's really brought us to this point to try to determine where will these other actors end up and what decisions will they make. Why is that? Because we're bringing significant supply as the world's number one oil and gas producer to the marketplace. Right, right. If we look back just four or five years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but today, primarily driven by technology, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling, we're able to now have this conversation. The big winner in it is the American consumer, now paying low prices for their gasoline, their diesel fuel, and we've got to keep that momentum going. That's why we focus on these politics, mm -hmm. whether you're a Democrat or Republican, and say, get the energy policy right, exactly. and, and, and we'll all worry we're hearing, less about what's going on overseas. And Jack, all we're hearing from the candidates uh, is a one note from both of them, although they are different notes. Donald Trump says, I'm going to bring back uh, old school coal jobs. Hillary Clinton says, I'm all for solar. That's not an energy policy. What would you well, like I'm, to see in an energy policy that spans and covers the gamut? Well, I'm going to give the President of the United States, President Obama, one bit of due credit here. Where a week or so ago in the garden, the South Lawn, mm -hmm. with uh, DiCaprio, he commented, we need to be realistic. We've got to think about what the reality is. The reality is fossil fuel provides the vast majority of the energy we consume today. Right. And all projections show it will continue to be the leading form of energy for us for many years to come. So the right policy is a true all of the above 
We want emerging technologies. The oil and gas industry are the leading investors in new forms of energy. But we've got to be realistic about what it's going to take to fuel this economy. We've got to move from 1% growth and get it up to where it's meaningful growth in our society, right, which right. will require even more energy. So if we get our politics right, we get our energy policy right, think realistically and think more broadly, it's better off for the American society, the American economy. Hillary Clinton is speaking now live in Tampa, Florida, and Jack, I agree with you. I think that if we encompass or encapsulate all forms of energy uh, with a tilt toward looking forward, certainly that may very well help. And as you modernize uh, North American energy infrastructure, that's a win for the infrastructure players, not just yes. uh, the energy world. So listen, Jack, great it's to have huge. you. It's huge. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Liz. Much. Always good to visit. Anytime. Jack Gerard is American Petroleum Institute CEO and President. Oil is falling in the aftermarket session by nearly 2%.